Welcome back everyone. Now that last lecture I understand was pretty full on. Uh, we're going to continue on with that this time, hopefully trying to fill in some of the gaps in the understanding for what these inductors are actually doing. This time we're going to combine an inductor, which is the L part of this. So there it is right there, the L. We're going to combine that with an R, which is a resistor. So we're putting a resistor in series with an inductor and then figuring out well, how long is it going to take for that magnetic field to build up or how long is it going to take for that magnetic field to collapse. Very similar to what's going on with the capacitor, just um, with a magnetic field instead of an electrostatic field. Now I've got a bit of a note here, in fact I've even written a little bit of a note. Um, so it says here, the theory behind the internal workings of an inductor can be certainly hard to understand. And I would agree with that, so I've taught this before and it generally takes a little while for the students to grasp what's going on with the internal workings of an inductor. But remember the key point is that an inductor will oppose any change in current. If you try and increase the current, it's going to go, oh, hang on a second, I don't want you to increase current, let's bring it back down to what it was, what I was sitting at before. But if you are sitting at a certain amount of current and then you try and decrease it, it again doesn't like that. It doesn't matter what you do, any sort of change, it's going to oppose it to bring it back to where it was. <clears throat> the way it does that is anytime we're changing the amount of current in the circuit, we're changing how big that magnetic field is, so it either grows bigger or it gets smaller. As and of course, if it grows bigger or gets smaller, it has to move to get there. And we know that any time we move a magnetic field through wires, it cuts into those wires, induces a voltage, and this voltage is opposite to the power supply voltage. So that's how it does the thing of opposing anything that you're trying to change. Now, <clears throat> remember how we had the RC time constant, which was a resistor in series, series with a capacitor. We applied a power supply to that, the capacitor would charge up and we could work out um, using our time constant formula how long it would actually take to get to a certain percentage or to get to 100%. The formula for um, the resistor capacitor was, so one time constant equaled resistance times capacitance. A little different now that we're dealing with inductors. Instead of being something like L times R, it's actually L on R. That is how we get one time constant. So I've given some values over here. I've got voltage applied at 10 volts. Resistor R1 is 100 ohms and inductor L1 is 200 millihenries. Capacitors are in farads, resistors are in ohms, and then inductors are in henries. So let's, let's figure it out for this particular circuit before we start to connect up power. One time constant is L on R. L is 200 millihenries, R is 100 ohms. So let's use our calculator here. So 200 millihenries, 200 exponential negative 3 to get milli divided by 100 ohms and we're getting 0 0.002 if you press the engineering button on your calculator you'd figure out well that is actually 2 milli and the answer is given in seconds so you could either write down 0 0.002 seconds or 2 milliseconds now remember that is one time constant Think back to the capacitor, how many time constants did it take to fully charge from being completely discharged? It was five. Exactly the same thing here. In fact, we're using a universal time constant chart because it's universal. You can use it for capacitors, you can use it for inductors. So, just like with a capacitor, it takes five time constants to fully charge from being completely discharged, or uncharged is how you would say that. But this time the charge is in the form of a magnetic field rather than an electrostatic field. You see what happens is you connect the switch and the magnetic field around the inductor builds up. It takes five time constants to do that. Once it gets there, we've got this big invisible magnetic field surrounding that inductor. That magnetic field can only stay there for as long as power is supplied or applied. Get rid of that and the magnetic field has to collapse and we'll get into that very soon. Now, something I want you to notice here is, or I've written in green, you may have noticed that the voltage and current labels are on the opposite curves compared to the capacitor. Current is now up here, voltage is now down here. With the capacitor, it was opposite. Voltage was here, current was here. So when we first connected the switch, if this was a capacitor, let's pretend, if you recall, the capacitor was completely discharged when we first started this thing. Because it was completely discharged, the voltage was zero. And then as the current started to flow, we had electrons building up down the bottom, electrons leaving the top and coming over to this uh, that way, which resulted in positive negative. 
and the voltage went up and up and up and up and up and after five time, time constants is all, all the way at the top. Now if we look at current in the circuit, in order to figure out current, just get rid of all this other stuff, current is the voltage across this resistor divided by that resistor. If the capacitor had zero volts when we first started, this must have the full 10 volts when we first started. 10 volts divided by 100 ohms, let's use a calculator just to be sure, 10 divided by 100 is 100 milliamps. So the current is all the way up here. As the capacitor charged, it takes away some of that 10 volts from the resistor, therefore we do the formula again, 9 volts divided by 100 ohms, you're now getting 90 milliamps and it keeps going down. So the current keeps going down and down and down and down, and when the capacitor is fully charged at 10 volts, there is now 0 volts across the resistor and therefore 0 current. So that was just a bit of a rehash on the capacitor just to make sure that um, we remember the the um, time constant chart and and just to show you that the inductor is the exact opposite of what the capacitor is doing. Now before we get into that with the inductor, let's just have a look at this one last thing. It will be fully charged in 10 milliseconds. How did we get 10 milliseconds? Well, it takes five time constants to fully charge. One time constant was two milliseconds. So five times two milliseconds, you're getting your 10. Okay, <clears throat> now let's connect the switch and see what's going on. Let's go green and we'll just make this a bit bigger. So we first connect that switch to there. As soon as we do that, so remember, there was no magnetic field built up around our inductor just yet, zero. There was no power supply connected to it. As soon as we connect the power supply, the magnetic field is gonna go really quickly. It's trying to go all the way to this big magnetic field. So we have these electrons traveling through the circuit. Those electrons go through the inductor. As it goes through the inductor, it starts to create a magnetic field. Let's get, uh, how about purple? So the magnetic field builds up around it. Now, I mean, we're not gonna do it, but if we were to zoom in and look at the individual wires, of course, as those electrons go through, it causes the magnetic field to start moving, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It cuts into all those wires induces a voltage into those wires. If we induce a voltage into those wires, we then get current flow in the opposite direction to produce a magnetic field of the opposite polarity to try and bring this back to zero. Because remember, it does not like change. It does not want you to then connect a power supply because that's a form of change because it was happy just sitting there with nothing. So it's trying to bring it back down to zero. So when we first start off, this gets the full 10 volts because of that rapid movement of cutting the magnetic field through the wires. This has zero volts. That's why we're starting down here in terms of current, because the voltage across the resistor is zero when we first start, while the voltage across the inductor is right up at maximum, which is 10. Now, as the magnetic field gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it actually slows down. If it's slowing down, just think back to this, if we're slowing down the speed of cutting through those wires, we're not actually inducing such a big voltage into those wires. So the voltage comes down. So it goes down to say nine volts. If that goes to nine volts, we have to share the full 10. This gets one. Therefore, the voltage goes down a little bit. The voltage across the resistor goes up by the same amount that this goes down. Therefore, the current comes up a bit. This goes down to eight volts. This goes up to two volts. So this voltage comes down. If the voltage across the resistor goes up, the current through the circuit must go up. And so you see they follow this same sort of curve that the capacitor followed. What is going to happen after 2 milliseconds? Well, if we have a look after 2 milliseconds, the voltage across the inductor will have dropped by 63%, roughly, I've rounded that value. It'll drop from 10 volts down 63% to 37% of maximum which is 3.7 volts, but we can check that on the calculator. We have 10 volts. We multiply that by 0.37 to get 37% of 10 volts, 3.7 volts. Okay, so we're now sitting at 3.7. Let's just get this a little bit smaller and we'll go red, a pen. So that's sitting at 3.7 volts. The current will be at 63% of maximum. So it starts off at nothing and then jumps up to 63% uh, percent of maximum 
while the voltage goes down by 63% on the inductor. And that took 2 milliseconds to happen. After another 2 milliseconds, we'll be at two time constants, or at our second time constant, which means the current in the circuit is now way up at 86%, while the voltage across the inductor has dropped by 86% and is now sitting at 14%. So that's because when we first start off on this thing, just like I said in the last lecture, it's like you're running a race. You start off really, really quick, but then you slow down as you, um, well, the further that you get. Similar sort of thing with this. Magnetic field starts moving really quickly, but it slows down as it's getting closer to um, its maximum size. So eventually we get all of these time constants, 2 milliseconds, 2 milliseconds, 2 milliseconds. After 10 milliseconds, the voltage across, sorry, I'll start with the current. The current in the circuit is now at 100%. That's because the resistor now has the full 10 volts. The inductor has zero volts because it's dropped all the way down to here. So why would the inductor now have no voltage across it? So the reason it has no voltage across it is because the only way it can have a voltage across it is if, just like with this magnet, is if this is moving either in that way or out that way. If we just get the magnet and put it in there and leave it, there's no voltage across it now. Because remember, to get a voltage, we must be cutting those wires with the lines of flux. If there's no movement, there's no cutting, there's no cutting, there's no voltage. So the magnetic field started off at zero, it grew and grew and grew and grew, and now it's just stationary there now. There's still a magnetic field there, but it's not moving anymore. That's why we get no voltage. Now, what about the polarity? Well, it builds up negative here, positive here because the electrons are traveling this way from negative through to the positive side of things. So that is how we're charging the capacitor. Now a little bit messy there, let's go on to the next one and see what happens when we discharge it. So this one looks exactly the same as what we use for the capacitor. We're now going to be using that magnetic field uh, built up around the inductor as a power supply just like we did with the capacitor. So we're going to take this switch off here. Now this, remember, was positive, negative. It had a big magnetic field built up around it. And I'll just get that purple color back again. Big magnetic field built up. But the key thing is the magnetic field was stationary after the five time constants. So it still had zero volts across there because the magnetic field wasn't moving at all. And this had the full 10 volts. All right. When we first connect, oh, let's, uh, there we go, let's get rid of that. When we first connect this switch away from there to here, uh, let's go, how about green? There we go. What's going to happen is the inductor over here goes, oh, hang on, changes happened again. I was quite happy to be sitting there with a constant magnetic field. But the only way that magnetic field could stay there was if the power supply was actually giving it current to stay there. Now we've gotten rid of the power supply. The inductor goes, oh, change again, and it hates change. So it goes, okay, I'm going to try and stop this. I want to keep my magnetic field there. I need that current to keep going in the same direction so that I can keep my magnetic field there. And that's exactly what it tries to do. So picture this big magnetic field. Take away the power supply. It's going to have to collapse because there's no power supply to keep it there anymore. So it starts to collapse. As it collapses, it's cutting through all the wires again, but this time, instead of cutting through it this way, it's cutting through it this way, which means we get the opposite polarity across the, um, the inductor. So instead of being positive up here, it's now negative up here. And instead of negative down here, it's positive down there. What does that do for current in the circuit? Well, let's have a look. What happens is current is always going to flow from negative to positive, dealing with electrons, so it's going to be going this way. Notice how it goes through the same, in the same direction compared to what it was going before. When we connected the power supply up, it went across from left, through the resistor to the right, up through this way. It's doing the same thing now. It's trying to keep that current flow exactly how it was before. The way that it does that is its field starts to get smaller, it collapses. As it collapses, we get um, 
cutting through the wires of the lines of flux, that induces a voltage, that voltage produces the current flow. However, because we don't have perfect components with no losses whatsoever, it cannot simply um, maintain that. So it's going to actually discharge. It goes down and down and down after one time constant, which is two milliseconds. We're still using 100 ohms and 200 millihenries. After two milliseconds, the voltage in the circuit and the current in the circuit uh, both drop by 63% down to 37. After another two milliseconds, we drop down by 86 to 14. After another two milliseconds, we drop by uh, 95 to 5. After another two milli, we drop by 98 to 2. And again, these are rounded off figures. And after two milliseconds, again, there's our five time constants. We should be at zero volts. That's because the magnetic field has gone all the way into nothing. It has disappeared. If there's no magnetic field, we're not cutting through anything. If we're not cutting, there's no voltage. If there's no voltage, there's no current. All right, so that is a little bit extra in terms of what an inductor is actually doing in a circuit. Now, hopefully all of these things that we've been talking about have, I guess, been cemented in. Of course, there's going to be questions on this with the quiz, so go through those. And I don't think I've said this before, but I mean, with anything that we've gone through here, um, make sure you make use of, of asking questions. If there is any questions that you, you need um, clarification on, just ask them and we'll, we'll see about fixing up all that, uh, that shortfall. All right, thank you for watching, guys. Enjoy your quiz.